Last week, the message was all about sin. That's why my mic broke. Now, today, the message is all about gospel. And my mic should not break today. <laughs> but reading through Romans up to the middle of chapter 3, it feels very much like going to see the doctor and being diagnosed with cancer. And the doctor tells you, you're going to die. And there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. And that's where we are when we read Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, up to verse 20. It's just bad news. We learn that we are totally unrighteous before God. We learn that we are totally depraved by sin. We learn that we're totally accountable to God. And we also learn that we're totally unable to do anything about it. We can't justify ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We can't erase our sin ourselves. When I say depravity, I don't mean that people are evil through and through. I, it means that morally, we've fallen far from the glory of God, far from what God intended us to be in this world, way short of his holy standard. And, and our sin totally affects our entire personality, our mind, our will, our emotion. It affects us socially in so many ways. So the image of God is there. It's not erased, but it's effaced. We're, we're not what we should have been when God made this perfect world. Thomas Sowell, who's now 93 years old, still such a brilliant man, he said, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. I think that's so true. So Paul doesn't begin Romans by telling people what they want to hear. He's helping people to see their great need for a great Savior. And good gospel work must do this. It must not shy away from the bad news. And this is especially true for religious people. Do you know that some of the most lost people in the world are religious people? They're lost in religion. Because a religious person who's raised uh, with religion, maybe even Christianity, they can be tempted to boast in their own goodness, their own self-righteousness, their own religious rights, their performance, or the works that they've done. But Romans 3.20 says, no one, no one will be justified before God by their own good works. Now we turn to verse 21. And the first two words are, but now. And if you like to mark in your Bibles, I would underline those two words, but now. They're very important because they announce the end of the bad news and they announce the beginning of the good news, which is the second section of teaching in the book of Romans. So let's imagine we're back in the doctor's office and the doctor has just told you that you're dying of cancer, but then he says, but now. And you say, but what? What's up, doc? Go on. What are you talking about? And then he says to you, well, he says, there has been revealed to me a new treatment by a specialist it's very promising, and it's the only way to save you. And you're going to say what? Tell me. Tell me more. I need to know. What is it? What is it? Well, that's what's happening here in the book of Romans. This section is all about God, God's righteous solution to righteous us, to rescue us from our sin, sickness, and death. So the title today is God's Righteousness Revealed. The outline is first, what God's righteous solution is. Second, what God's righteous solution is not. And then third, how should we respond? So let's read ver uh, first verses 21 to 26. In the Greek, this is all one long sentence, and it's absolutely loaded with gospel. Uh, one Bible scholar called this 
the most important paragraph in the Bible. I don't know how you could ever decide that. I would never say that, but this is really good stuff. I was glad to hear last Sunday someone from the church at the picnic told me that they're memorizing large chunks of Romans at home. I was so glad to hear that. And I would, I would think that if that is one of your goals, you would want to memorize this passage right here. Let's think deeply about these words. But now, verse 21, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, but it is the righteousness of Righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly, that, that means on the cross as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed go unpunished for the demonstration, that is, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is God's word. Now, Father, thank you for this bread that we can chew on, this truth that brings life. I pray that we would saturate ourselves, meditate deeply, remind ourselves of these great gospel truths. May we never forget about it. May I never stop preaching it. May the church never ever not be grounded on these great gospel truths. I pray for the children who are here who don't know the meaning of these words like redemption and propitiation and, and justification. Lord, may we teach them and help them to understand these awesome truths of the word of God for their salvation, for everyone's salvation. Amen. So beginning in verse 21... The topic changes from our total depravity and judgment before God to this revelation of our total righteousness and our acceptance before God. Do you like the thought of that? Of being totally accepted before the eyes of God? That's what this is about. Verse 26 says, God is the justifier. That means God declares righteous. He's the just justifier, declaring us righteous. This idea of justification and all these, these words in that family, like just and justifier and justified and justification, that appears 200 times in the New Testament. Do you think that's important? That's an important concept? It is a huge gospel word. We must know it. I think the first definition I heard of justified was this. Just if I'd never sinned. Just if I'd never sinned. Now that's pretty good. But it's more than that. It's being justified, being declared righteous. So it's not justified, never sinned. It's also justified, obeyed every command ever, give, ever given by God with a total righteous standing and total forgiveness. That is the gospel. So let's look first at what God's righteous solution is. It is revealed, verse 21 says. So this passage tells us that God provides a righteousness that is beyond this world, that is beyond anyone's reach. It's not a righteous supplement, like a multivitamin, that, that makes up for the righteousness we lack. It's a totally different kind of righteousness. It's beyond human. It has nothing to do with us. We have nothing to, uh, nothing to say about it. It's his righteousness that he reveals. 
And second, it, it is uh, a righteousness that is witnessed. It's not new in the sense that Paul is making it up. It's been there all along in the Old Testament. The prophets spoke about it. And when we get to chapter 4 next week, we will see how Abraham was a witness of this kind of righteousness. And this is before the law of Moses. This is before the rite of circumcision, which meant that you were in, in, in the kingdom. And so this is the righteousness that Abraham witnessed. We'll read about later. And it is a righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith here means trusting in someone else. Trusting in the work, the word, the righteous life of Jesus. God, God doesn't pull this revealed righteousness out of a hat somewhere and give it to us. The righteousness he's giving with us is the righteousness that is in Jesus. That is what he credits to us by faith. And it's for all people. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but by faith all can be made right by Jesus. There's no distinction it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, if you're Jewish or Gentile, if you were raised as an atheist or raised in a Christian home. It's for everyone without distinction. Everyone who would be righteous by God must come to Jesus. And it's a righteous gift by his grace. This, this righteousness is freely given by God. It does not cost us anything. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. It's by grace. And, and here's another definition. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Jesus paid for it. And, and it's a righteous redemption through Christ. Redemption means Christ died to pay the ransom price to liberate us from our slavery to sin. Now, many, many citizens in, at Rome at this time were slaves. They understood this concept of redemption, that there were ways and methods for them to be purchased out of slavery. Well, Christ is our redemption. He paid with his life to set us free. And, and it's also a righteous propitiation in Christ's blood. Propitiation. Did anybody use that in a sentence this week? It's another great gospel word. We don't want to lose the meaning of this. It, it means to appease, to be merciful. So the blood of Jesus holds back, appeases God's wrath, so then it, in his mercy he can be restored in fellowship with us. So this language here is from the Old Testament from the Holy of Holies and the mercy seat. It's the same word as used to describe the mercy seat. Remember the mercy seat? That's the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. And there were two angels there. And the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, stand in front of the Ark of the Covenant once a year, and he'd make atonement for the sins of Israel. How would he do it? He would stand before the Ark right in front of that cover and he would take goat's blood and he would sprinkle goat's blood on that cover. And that would propitiate God. That would atone for our sins. But it was only for a year. You had a year of life insurance. <laughs> but Jesus propitiates us once for all time. He covers and he turns the wrath of God away from us. He is God's mercy seat. And then this righteousness is available at this present time. God's righteousness, God's forgiveness, God's mercy is available to anyone, anywhere, not tomorrow, but today, this moment, the moment, anyone trusts in Jesus' saving work on the cross. You are justified, your sin is completely removed and you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ once for all time. That is God's righteousness revealed. So this gospel is about a provided righteousness. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Jesus. 
And when we think about communion today, remember that on the cross there was a double substitution. Jesus took our sin. He died in our place. God transferred Christ's righteousness to our account. And in this way, God is both both just and he's the justifier because a just God always punishes sin. And a justifying God has to have a means to make us righteous, to declare us righteous. And he does that by transferring the righteousness of Christ to us. This is the gospel. I know there's a lot of big words in there. You can say it in a shorter way. You can explain it to your children with easier terms. You don't have to say propitiation. You can just say God isn't mad at you anymore because of Jesus. That'll work. You won't have to be punished. You won't have to have a time out. He'll totally accept you into his heaven because of Jesus. Now Martin Luther said, this teaching on the justification by faith alone is the article on which the church will stand or fall. Do you believe that? I believe that. And I would add that this teaching, the justification by faith alone, is the article on which your Christian life will probably stand or fall. Because you'll have to make a decision sometime in your life. Are you going to trust in you to live for Christ? Or are you going to trust in him completely to live for Christ? And you'll find out that you're still a fallen person. (laughs) And you will need to lean on Jesus more and more as you follow him. So that is what God's righteousness is. Now let's look at a few more verses that tell us what God's righteousness is not. Verse 27. Where then is boasting? It has been excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No. By a law of faith. Faith is the way now, not by law-keeping, he's saying. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Far from it. On the contrary, we establish the law. So Paul says some things here about what God's righteousness is not. Is not anything that we can boast about. Look what I did. Once again, Paul is addressing specifically in this diatribe He's addressing these Jewish detractors who are so proud of their law-keeping, so proud of it, and everything that they're doing. But he tells them, though your religious privileges are great, no one will stand before God and brag about their good deeds. No one. We don't have a leg to stand on. So we can't boast We can boast about Jesus, but we can't boast about us. Look what we did. And it's not based on our works or our law-keeping, verse 28. God provided this righteousness to us. It has nothing to do with us at all. This righteousness is apart from our good works. And it's for all people. It's not for some people. There's one God, there's one way of salvation for all people, whether Jew or Gentile or whoever in the world. It's one way. It's for everyone. Everyone must come through Christ to have this righteousness. And it doesn't mean that the law is nullified. You don't say, well, we can't keep the law, so why keep it? Throw it out. I mean, it's all by faith. But the law was never meant to be a system of salvation. It was never meant to be a system of salvation. The law is absolutely necessary to establish the fact that there is sin and that we are sinners 
and that we need a Savior. And that Savior can't come by just keeping the law. The law and the gospel, they work together like hand and glove. Well, finally, how should we respond to this? And for this, I think we turn back to chapter 1, Romans 1, verse 16, where it says, this is this, this purpose statement of really the whole book of Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, and here's, this will sound familiar because it's what's happening in chapter 3, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the righteous one will live by faith. So how do we respond? We should believe this word. And we should believe it freshly again today. We should live by faith in Jesus, always by faith in Jesus. We should not be ashamed of the gospel. We should never be ashamed of the gospel. We should share the gospel it is the power of God. It is the only way of salvation. It is the only way of total acceptance before God. This week, I was at the memorial service for Alex Zell. Alex was a, an alliance. Alex and Julie were alliance missionaries in Brazil. He was a pastor, then he was in charge of the graduate ministry program at Crown, and he just started coming to Living Rock this year. He liked our church, he wanted to be here, and he would have been awesome, he and Julie together, in blessing our church. So I talked to Julie, and I wanted to know what was happening in those last hours. And they went on their family trip to see the national parks out west. I think they were in Glacier, and then they had friends up in Calgary, Alberta, and they were just across the border into North Dakota. Julie was sleeping. Alex was listening to an audio book, and the audio book was about how to share your faith with lost people. And Julie leaned over and looked at Alex, and he was weeping. Tears coming down his face. And she surmised that he was weeping for the lost. That's what Alex was thinking about before he had that massive heart attack. He, he told Julie, I'm tired. He went over into the passenger seat. And he said, I don't feel good. And his heart gave out. But he had five hours, five hours to live as she watched his heart rate decline in the hospital. He got to talk to all three daughters. He got to talk to Julie. He had made his peace with God. He had shared his faith with everybody he met. And he is at peace with Jesus today. Amen. Yesterday, I was thinking about this, and I started praying for my neighbors again because I, I had kind of given up on my neighbors. But I started praying for my neighbors again. I thought, you know what? Some of my neighbors are lost, and I'm going to try to reach out to them this year, this summer, invite them to church because they, they need salvation. Amen? Martin Lloyd-Jones he taught a lot on Romans. I think he did 600 sermons on Romans. It's just crazy. <laughs> I could never do that. <laughs> but he said this doctrine of justification by faith alone, it's, it's most important. It teaches us the way of salvation. But he believed it's also the best tool for Christians to fight doubt and depression. He wrote a whole book called Spiritual Depression. It was very helpful to me years ago when I read it. 
And he said, the answer to your depression is to study the doctrine of justification. (laughs) So he said this, sometimes we have depressing thoughts, we have doubts. The devil attacks our mind. Yes, the devil does attack our mind. And then we begin to think we're not a Christian, we're not a very good Christian. And then we let our past, our sin, our failures try to define us. Or or we can remember these two words we've read today, but now. And you can begin to remember who you are in Christ. And then sometimes we can feel condemned when we read the Bible because we never measure up. Or we can compare ourselves to other Christians, and other Christians may put us down. They think we're not very good. And then we have to remember verse 21 again. But now. And remember who God says we are. He justified us by faith. It just reminds us that we're no longer defined by this world. We're no longer defined by what we think of ourselves or what we do or don't do. And we're not defined by what other people think of us, even other Christians. We are defined and accepted by this righteousness revealed to us by faith in Christ. Amen? That should lift up your spirits. By faith in Christ, we take on this new identity. We're fully accepted. We're fully forgiven. We're deeply loved. We're clothed in this perfect, righteous robes of Jesus. That is who God declares us to be. He justifies us by faith. And by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, That is what we will be one day because he's working in us and through us to bring us to that perfected, glorified state, that state of our final salvation, which is still ahead. Amen? This is the gospel. Pray with me. If you're here today and you have doubts about what you believe, and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, will you pray the short prayer with me? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he perfectly obeyed all of your law. Thank you that he died in my place on the cross. Thank you that he took my death. Thank you that you gave me by faith the righteousness of Jesus. Thank you for this substitution. Thank you for salvation. I've done nothing to deserve it. But this day, I thank you for Jesus who did all this for me. Amen. Now, before we take communion today, I'd like us to make a confession of our sin and know that full cleansing of God this morning from Psalm 51. Have mercy on us, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Purify us from our sins and we will be clean. Wash us and we will be whiter than snow. Amen. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. He said, this cup represents a new covenant, a new promise for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.